So today we're talking about the power of words. Just a few words can change a circumstance or change a situation. I told a story years ago, a lot of you wouldn't have been around in that era, but there was a season where we were doing events around New York City and all the boroughs of New York. And we were in town, Shelly and I had checked into our hotel, Lower Manhattan. I decided to go out for a run. I mean, because look at me. And uh, I running through the streets of New York is pretty interesting because there's stuff to do, things to dodge. Uh, but I ended up sort of over near the East River in a construction zone, and the road got a little complicated. I had to decide whether I was going to jump over this construction fence or keep going down the road this way. So long story short, uh, it was raining, freezing cold, and I was not in running shape. And so I was very focused on staying alive and not dying during this run and didn't notice that I was running down the middle of a six-lane expressway called the FDR, which if you ever travel along the East River on that side of Manhattan, you'll just think, wow, my pastor is not very smart. Um, but the, the thing was that there was a huge traffic jam, and so none of the cars were moving. I was really the only thing moving. And it didn't dawn on me until I came up to the United Nations headquarters that I was in the middle of somewhere where I didn't need to be. This was shortly after 9-11. There may still be uh, cops under the United Nations headquarters where the FDR literally goes under the building, but there certainly were at this time, and they were on high alert. And someone came over the loudspeaker in the car and said, hey, come to the vehicle. And I looked up like, who is talking over a loudspeaker? I saw these police cars sitting up on this concrete esplanade sort of that way. And all of a sudden, the lights were going around. And the person came on the loudspeaker again and said, now, come now. And so I thought, I think they're talking to me. So I jogged on over towards the cars, kind of realizing it in that moment where I was. And the, the police officer gets out of the car. And I can't quote directly the question that was asked to me, um, but in a very sort of, uh, you know, flesh-inspiring tone, the question was asked, what the blank do you think you're doing? And immediately when a question happens like that, it causes me to get in the spirit really fast. And so... <laughs> I felt the Holy Spirit taking charge of my mind and my mouth in that moment. No, no, wait a minute. No, that's not what happened. Uh, I felt my flesh actually rise up inside of me in that moment. And I answered that simple question with another question, which I typically like to do. And I said, what does it look like I'm doing? And so as I had my hands on the police car and... They were putting the handcuffs on me. I realized that those seven little words, what does it look like I'm doing, could be really costly words. I'll save you the whole rest of the story, but uh, I got to share the gospel with the officer, baptized him in the East River. I think he's here today uh, in uh, either one of our... Are you here? No, none of that happened. But, we, we, but I didn't get arrested, thank you, Lord, and I, I didn't say much else for a long time. I, I realized right away, no more words need to come out of my mouth, period. Do you have ID? I'm like, no, I don't. I just have my running shorts, the T-shirt the tennis shoes, and a room key from our hotel, which doesn't even have the name of the hotel on it. That's how big of a problem I had. Sitting in the back of the car for the next hour, uh, listening to this man talk to me, uh, was fantastic and awesome. And I realized seven words can change everything. Do you realize that seven words can end a marriage? The right combination and choice of seven words can split up business partners. Seven words spoken at the wrong time in the wrong spirit can set a house on fire or terminate a relationship or set the direction for your entire future and all the people you're going to impact in your life. And that's what James is getting at today. He's trying to help us come to the understanding that our words do, in fact, shape our future. 
I, I love the fact that we're several weeks now into James. If you're just joining us, please get one of the free journals and jump on board. Get in where we are today. But as you study a book over time like we are, you start understanding, right, that you can sort of diagnose, if you will, and then diagram a a section of scripture. It's not just like, oh, I looked at chapter 3, verse 17, because that's the one I highlighted. I'm starting to see this as a whole message. And in James, you understand in chapter 1, at the end, there are two verses. We've gone back to them in every single message so far. The first of these two verses that in chapter 1 say that if you have a relationship with God, just translating religion into what it really means in our context, and you say you are a follower of God, and you do have a life with Jesus, and you can't tame your tongue, your whole relationship with Jesus is worthless. You're like, whoa, that's like pretty confrontational. And then that last verse of chapter 1, he says, hey, I want you to look after widows and orphans in their time of need and to keep yourself spotless in a polluted world. And so chapter two, he unpacks that. What does it look like to care for the poor, to not show favoritism, to have a faith that actually works? Chapter three, he unpacks the verse above it. What would it look like to tame the tongue? So we see that in this church and in this moment, two big issues going on. One, a lot of people had the talk without the walk. And two, somebody had the talk that was tearing the church apart. And James said, I want to take both of these things head on because these are huge issues, not only in this church, but I think obviously the Holy Spirit knew these were going to be the issues of our church and of the church of Jesus Christ moving forward. So let's look at this issue of taming the tongue. It gets opened up for us in chapter 3 and then trickles down into chapter 4. We're going to see four obvious things in the flow of the text and four takeaways today, practical ways that this understanding can change our lives and everything around us. The first thing that we see in the text is the tongue is tiny, but its power is titanic. And we already knew that, but James highlights it for us by giving us these illustrations about putting bits in horses' mouths or about a little rudder being able to change the direction of an entire ship. He says the tongue, it's a tiny thing, but the power of it is titanic. In fact, it has the power, he says in the text here, to give direction to your entire life. Think about that for a moment that you may end up 25 years from now all the way over there just because of your tongue. Not the degree you got from the school you went to, not the person you married, not the neighborhood you grew up in, not the church that you're a part of, but your tongue got you all the way over there. And then James says, also the tongue is tiny, but it has titanic power to destroy. And he uses the illustration of a little spark starting a fire and burning down an entire forest. This Titanic idea, I went back to the Titanic. We all understand what that is. And it was a massive ship, three soccer fields long, 10 stories high, thousands of passengers. And it was all controlled by this rudder uh, in this photo over here, you, you can see the propellers on the back of the ship. You can see the little guy in the photo. Can we highlight the guy? It took me a minute to find him. Uh, um, there's a, a man standing in the photo there. And then the rudder, some of you still kind of like, okay, now what's the rudder? The rudder's that thing right there. I think we can highlight that as well. That rudder, and you can see it in relative size to the guy, is determining the direction of this entire ship. And so James first wants you to get that picture in mind. The second thing that flows out of the text is that the mouth makes the sound, but the heart is the source. So James quickly goes beneath the surface a little bit to say, yeah, all the words are coming out of this, but the heart really is the source of it all. And you see this a little bit further down in this middle paragraph. Look in verse 9. It says, with the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in God's 
likeness. And then he comes down and he asks a question like, how can this happen? In verse 11, can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? So what, what James is doing is saying, yeah, the, the, the words are powerful to direct and possibly to destroy, but the words come out of the heart. And then, third thing we see in the text, he zeroes in on the issues of the heart. And when he does, he pulls all of us in today to say, let God's spirit do a little heart surgery today because it has the power, this surgery, to change the direction of your life and to keep you from burning down the things that you love. And he highlights two issues of the heart. Down in the next section, he's talking about this wisdom of God in verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Well, let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. Now, that word humility is going to be a very, very important word in our message today. If you're someone who's struggling with your mouth, just a little heads up for where the message is going today. It's an issue of pride which can be mitigated by the Spirit of God leading you into humility. That's the simplicity of this message today. You know, all of us are struggling with what we say. Everyone in this gathering, I would guess, in the last 10 days has said at some point, I wish I hadn't said that. Anybody said that in the last 10 days? I wish I hadn't said that. Or, um, at least a few of us had, I like that, three dozen of us had said that in the last 10 days. Or, it's companion phrase, um, not only, I wish I hadn't said that, but then we ask the question, I don't know why I said that. Anybody said that in the last 10 days? I don't know why I said that. That was dumb. I mean, we may have not had the humility to admit it out loud. I don't have the humility a lot of times to admit it and to say to Shelly, I'm sorry I said that. That was dumb. But I'm certainly thinking, man, I wish I hadn't said that. I don't know why I said that. That was totally stupid of me to say that. And you know, when I've thought about it, it's not just when I said something that was hurtful. It was when I said something that I don't, I was like, why did I tell them that? I didn't need to tell them that. Well, why did I say that? Why did I do that? And, and we see this play out in our lives all the time. I mean, gossip takes a lot of different forms. One kind of gossip that we think is gossip is the kind that tears other people down. And, and this is an issue of the heart, right? I feel better somehow if I tear someone else down. I feel better about my situation, my circumstance, my identity, if I can just knock your identity down. Now, I don't, I don't want to hurt you, really. I just want to let everybody know that you're not as great as they think you are. The other kind of gossip, though, is I just tell all the information I know in life because it makes me look good. It makes me look like I know something or I, I know somebody or I'm, on, I'm inside the loop. And so I just tell everything. You know, those people are like a sprinkler that you put in the front yard. It's just information coming out. Who walks up? I'll start telling you something. Next person, I'll tell you something. Hey, how's it going? Did you know? Hey, did you know? Did you know? If I know, you're going to know because I don't know anything that I don't tell everybody. And both of these kinds of gossip are hard issues. They're, they're hard issues that show that we're not at peace yet with who we are. And these are the things that we always end up going. I don't know why I said that. I mean, they're the naysayers in life, and some of us do that with our tongue. We are officially sent by God to planet Earth to let everybody know why everything is not going to work. And that's our contribution to the world. Oh, yeah, well, I bet that won't work. Oh, yeah, I bet they haven't thought about so-and-so. Yeah, but, you know, check back with me in three months. And that's the role. They're the toppers. That's a hard issue. You know the toppers? Have you met them? You know who I'm talking about? You told them that you had a baby girl? We just had a baby girl? Oh, well, was it an underwater birth? Because we've had all of our babies in underwater, natural saltwater, spring-fed birth from <laughs> Miramar Spring. And when our babies were born underwater, there was classical music playing because when I was on my prenatal retreat in the Himalayas and I had hiked up to 17,000 feet, I wrote a sonata for each one of our children. And <laughs> now, where, where did y'all have your baby? Yeah, it's Piedmont. What is that? 
It's a heart issue. It's somehow me having to be a little better than you. So I'm going to steal the joy out of everything you did. We went and ate at Lanou Friday night. You did. Oh, that's great. Did you eat at the private chef table in the back of the kitchen where the open fire pit is and they roast your food right by the table? No. <laughs> yeah, when we were there, the chef opened a bottle of wine from his private cellar. It was so good. And we, uh, we roasted our own dinner that night that we killed that day with the bows and arrows out of Namibian wood that we carved in the archery seminar that we'd gone on earlier that morning on horseback through the woods. And then we came back to the restaurant and they had a sous chef there from France. Amazing. Just happened to be there that day, deboned all the meat and Spitfire grilled it right by the table. And then they made a bachamel sauce like right on the table and served it at our table. We were toasting with the chef. It was a great night. What, what did y'all have when you were there? What is all this? Why do people tear people down? Why can people not say everything they know? Why does everything I do have to be better than everything you do? Why do I have to be such a naysayer and a downer on everything that comes across my path? And James is saying, it's a heart issue. It goes down to the core of who we are. And this is what he's getting at when he comes to this particular section about us being wise and seeing the picture of what true wisdom looks like. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in the humility, the humility that keeps me from needing to tear you down and keeps me from needing to push me up. But if you harbor, and now he's going to come and define our heart for us, if you harbor two things, bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom, see the quotes around it, little air quotes there, we can all do those. Such wisdom, this kind of person who always seems to have an opinion, always wants to chime in, doesn't know when to stop talking, has never met a situation that they didn't need to frame the conversation before with all their wisdom. This person who has the inside track, have you heard? This person who's got... The the drop-the-mic moment, did you know? This kind of wisdom, don't you love this? No, people aren't loving this. I love this. This is like getting all up in our world. This kind of wisdom, do you know this? Has Has anybody been this person? Are you this person? Do you know this person that's got all this wisdom? Hey, we need to pray for so and so. Don't you love the incessant intercessor? Well, we should pray for for, um, Larry's wife. (laughs) Do you get what I'm saying, though? It's slightly uncomfortable, I know, but that wisdom. He's going to define it for us now, and it is not pretty. He says, this kind of wisdom, quote, unquote, does not come down from heaven, but is earthly and spiritual of the devil. For where you have, and here comes the conditions of the heart again, envy, he calls it bitter envy above, and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. The way the gospel says it, Luke 6, 43, for out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so what James is helping us do is understand a couple of things. We all kind of want to focus more on this guy. This could be the whole message today. You know, make sure that this was, this was where a lot of the focus was when I was growing up. Because when we grew up at our house, my mom would wash our mouth out with soap regularly. I hate to say regularly, but it happened often. Did anybody grow up in this era? I'm sure that's against the law right now. Couldn't happen. 
But man, my mom, she heard it. She's coming with a bar of soap and a toothbrush from under the sink. Not like a nice toothbrush, like the one that was, you know, just under the cabinet in the sink. And it was like, open your mouth. And if you ever say that again, I don't ever want to hear that word come out of your mouth again. You better never use that kind of language again. I better never hear you talk like that. And this James thing could get like that and we could just all do this. But what James is wanting us to understand is the thing that does this is this. This moves this. So if we did a whole message today on don't do this, don't say this, don't act like this, don't let these words, we'd be missing the message today. James said the message is there's something in your heart that God needs to heal. And the something is Bitter envy and selfish ambition. Now, we already know what those are, but when you do a deep dive into the original language that this book is written in, man, it just helps kind of like open up these words. That that qualifier, bitter envy, envy being jealousy, we all know what jealousy is. I want what I can't get or I want what you have. I don't want you to have what you have. What, what you have makes me feel not great about what I have. That's jealousy, and we all have it. Every one of us has jealousy. But bitter envy, bitter jealousy, that qualifier is the word malignant. In other words, it's spreading. It's cancerous. It's unchecked, undealt with. It's been sitting there too long and it's working its way into everything inside of you right now. The selfish ambition is what it sounds like. I want my way ahead of everybody else's way. I will get myself to the place I want to be, even at the cost. This is all in packed into the Greek word. At the cost of destroying somebody else in the process of doing it. And I'll get my way even over God's way. And then when James comes down, he says, here's how this works itself out. He says, this kind of wisdom is earthly, unspiritual, and from the devil. And where you have these things at work, you find disorder. Can you say that word with me? Disorder. And when you unpack that word, it is unbelievable. All of us have been there. He, the, the, the sort of big picture here is that wisdom of God. And we see it in, in the text and we see it even in James earlier. It's the wisdom that comes down from God. And it describes it. It's peaceable. It's perfect. It, it, it puts things in order. God speaks. His wisdom comes down and chaos goes into order. The devil speaks when he can find someone's mouth to use through their bitter envy and selfish ambition. And then the devil speaks and he does the opposite of what God does. God brings order out of chaos. The devil takes order and turns it into chaos. Disorder. You want to hear what is all packed into that word? And just see if you see this around you anywhere. Disturbance, upheaval, revolution, anarchy, unsettled, unstable, cannot stand, instability, disorder, commotion, confusion, things being out of control, things being up for grabs, an uncertainty and tumult that inevitably generates more instability. This is how the enemy works. The enemy looks for unchecked bitter envy and unchecked selfish ambition. And then the enemy uses those things to move the mouths of people and their words tear things apart. tear families apart, tear relationships apart, tear churches apart, tear everything God wants to put together apart. And you see that unfold right in the text. See, don't you just love how if you just kind of step back, you just see the text just unfold. So chapter 4, verse 1, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your 
desires that battle within you. You want something, but you don't get it. You kill and covet, but you can't have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you don't ask God. And that's, we're going to see that how this really works. And when you do ask, you don't receive because you ask with the wrong motive. And what was the motive? It was my selfish ambition, actually, because I wanted to spend what I got on my own pleasure. Yeah. So we've seen that the tongue is tiny, but its power is titanic. We've seen that the mouth makes a sound, but the heart is the source. We've seen that the two big issues of the heart are bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. So what's the solution? Well, I have some good news today. There is a solution. And the solution is not just to zip our lips. The solution is to bend our knees. So the, the message isn't going to be, man, we got we to gotta close our mouths because, you know, loose lips sink ships. No, the solution is we need to bend our knees and go back to that humility word. And that's where James leads us. And so he comes down in verse 4. And pardon me just for a second, but this is one of the most straight right punch verses in the Bible. I mean, this is no messing around here. If you're MMA or somebody like that, you know what I'm talking about. This is just like you're going out right here and right now. There's not a lot of, you know, tiptoeing around in this verse. Here's how he addresses a person with unchecked bitter envy and unchecked selfish ambition who's using their mouth to tear apart the church of Jesus Christ. This is how he addresses them. You adulterous people. Woo, thank you. Why don't you just tell me what you feel? Don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. And then he goes on to explain how this works. And he comes down to verse 8, but, it, but he gives us more grace. This is why scripture says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, a lot of us know this verse and have heard this verse, but we didn't know that this verse fit into a conversation about the way that our words can bring disorder from the pit of hell itself and tear things apart. But if anybody is in that position and you realize, wait a minute, I don't have a good heart. I have a lot of jealousy in my heart. I have a lot of me in my heart. I need to knock you down to lift me up. I need to tell everybody everything I know so that makes me look smarter or better or more in charge or whatever it is about me that I cannot manage and control my tongue. If that's you, good news, God's got a lot of grace for you. Isn't that great? God's got grace. God says, I can work, I can move, I can change, I can fix all of this in here and ultimately make a big, big difference in this out here. And we know that's the process of being filled with the Spirit, crucifying the flesh, and being made into the image of Jesus Christ. I mean, we see this Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. It says, the acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, Hatred, discord, and then there's our candidate, jealousy, fits of rage, and there's character number two, selfish ambition. And what do they lead to? Dissensions, factions, and envy. And then he goes on to say, this is the kind of stuff I've been telling you about the whole time, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. And here comes the question that James had asked. Who then can tame the tongue? Self-control. So he now finds an answer to his question in Paul's letter, Galatians. Who can tame the tongue? I ask you, who can tame the tongue? Who can tame the tongue? Who? Who can tame the tongue? The Holy Spirit can tame the tongue. But taming is uh, a process and takes some exertion, if you will. And God wants to do that in me and in you. And he's got a lot of grace to do that. And why would he say, you adulterous people? Why, why would he get into that moment? Because he's asking the question of all the questions today. He's asking the question of the heart. And this is the question he's asking me today. Is God enough 
for you. Because it looks like what James is saying, you want to be the bride of Christ, but it looks like you're still dating the world. It looks like you know you're chosen, adopted, filled, blessed, called, appointed, saved, sons, daughters, heirs. Looks like all that, but it surely looks like you're still getting your self-worth from how much money you have in the bank or what your friends say or what you wear or where you live or the color of your hair or the size of your bicep or the position in your company or what you know about what you know. It looks like you're getting all your identity, security, self-worth and view of life over here with the world. Even though you said I'm the bride of Christ. Being the bride of Christ apparently wasn't enough. That's James saying all that. And the question that has to come back to me and you, before we start saying, hey, I got to learn how to stop talking. I got to learn how to stop running my mouth. I got to learn how to stop tearing people down. I got to learn how to change all this behavior up here. No, I need to figure out, is God enough for me? Is being a loved daughter of the King of Kings enough for me? And if it is, it's going to lead me to have this attitude. You see the words four times in these few verses together, submission and humility, submission and humility, humility, submission, humility, submission. What does this mean? It means that I'm bending my knees as I'm walking beside the king of the universe, hand in hand with the creator of everything. He says, I'm awesome. I mean, not because of me, but he has done some amazing things in my life and made me who I am. And you know what else it says? It says at the right time, he'll exalt me to wherever he wants me to be. It says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he might exalt you at the proper time. So you know what? I'm good. I don't have to tear you down to get up because I'm holding hands with the king of the universe and he'll get me up when he wants me up. He'll put me wherever he wants me to be. And I don't need to tell everybody what I know about everything because I know the king of the universe and he is enough for me. I feel good about me. My heart is finding peace and rest in thee. And Man, when James takes us by the hand and says, there's grace to get you here, to get you under, so that God then can hold you up, all of a sudden, our outlook on the world around us changes. And I think we see this happen in a few different outcomes quickly for our lives. And they they would look like this, I believe, as God's doing this work inside you and me. Number one, it, the Spirit of God will, will lead us with a, a healing heart to speak what is true, but not just to speak what is true, to do what the Bible says in Ephesians, to speak the truth in love, and then even to take it a step further, to speak the truth in love only when it's really necessary. That's an amazing Holy Spirit fruit in our lives. The quote looks like this, if you want to take a little quick snapshot of it or write it down really fast. If you propose to speak, always ask yourself, is it true? Is it necessary? Is it kind? And just with that filter over and a little lean towards the Holy Spirit to say, I need your help and I need your grace right now. I'm submitting to this big idea that I'm a loved son of the king. I'm a loved daughter of the king and the sovereign God is in charge of my life. And now I'm thinking, I don't have to say what I was going to say. I can do what Paul said when he said, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, Ephesians 4, 29. But only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen and don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God, the one who's trying to give you self-control and tame your tongue with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So I'm, I'm filtering now. Is this true what I'm saying? 
Is it necessary what I'm saying? Is it kind what I'm saying? And because my heart is shifting, I can use that filter. A second practical help, and this I think is, could be a game changer for every one of us, is to publicly celebrate and cheer for others. It's one of the best ways to stick a knife in bitter envy is to build a habit of celebrating other people publicly. You're like, we're not supposed to celebrate people and glorify people. No, I'm not talking about glorifying people. I'm just talking about the power that comes when you feel the twinge of jealousy and instead of using that to try to push down the person's success, you fight that by using this to celebrate the person's success. Social media may have a boatload of problems, but one of the best things about it is you can tell your whole world in a moment how you're celebrating someone else. And what I've learned in life is it's hard to privately tear down what you've already publicly celebrated. So if you're not on social media, that's fine. Just find the forums whenever you feel this. I remember Andy writing about this, and I felt like it was so powerful. Andy Stanley, another pastor in our town, writing about this. I felt like it was so powerful because he was talking about me. He was talking about that tendency, if you have, live a public life, you do your thing that you do in life in front of a bunch of people, and there are a lot of other people in the city doing what you do at the same time, like there are today, and there are other churches, and some might be bigger, and some might be smaller, and some might have the microphone right now, and some might have more of the attention. And Andy said, whenever I feel that little twinge in my heart, I want to fight it by finding another message from another pastor and celebrating that message and telling everybody how great that message is. And I remember there was a season of life where he would just tweet all the time, hey, incredible message I listened to today. It would be another pastor's message that he would actually put a link to and say, you should go and watch this. And I'm like, that is how I need to fight that jealousy that can build up in my heart. So I'm not saying if you own a small business, you should, you know, be Instagramming that your competitor's product is actually better than yours. I keep that on the, on the DL. But the people in your company, like the, the girl that got the promotion that you thought you should have got, now she's a regional, whatever, whatever, and you, you still think you're better than her, find a way to celebrate her out loud in front of your whole company. Find a way to say something positive about her. Louis, there's like, you'd have to look pretty hard to find something about her to celebrate. Okay, look hard. She has incredible shoes. Best shoes in our company. Find a way to celebrate the people who you think are threatening you. And when you develop this discipline or this habit of publicly celebrating the people that look like they're threatening you or just a, a person in your life. This person was awesome today. I celebrate them. I cheer for them. I put them in the view. Not, I want to make sure we don't talk about them because that threatens me when you're talking about them. Oh, you read their book and not my book? Oh, wow. Well, hmm, I'm not ever mentioning that because that threatened something inside of me. See, we all have the jealousy, but one of the ways we fight it is by publicly celebrating. Celebrate your boss. Celebrate the leaders at your company. Celebrate the authorities that God has put over your life. Celebrate your peers. Celebrate who looks like a threat. Celebrate your neighbor. Celebrate somebody you met in a random situation that did an act of kindness. That develops a muscle, because we got into the habit of being jealous, and you get into the habit of celebrating people, and I think the two things deflate each other in time. Another practical takeaway is to seek and make it your ambition to say less and not more. I could back this up with a lot of scripture. But the goal in life is not to squeeze the most words into every single moment in time. The goal in life is to say things that are meaningful and helpful. That doesn't mean we can't have a conversation where we're laughing and talking about, you know, the fact that Georgia beat Auburn. 
it doesn't mean that every single conversation has to be a verse of scripture. It just means that we realize that we're shaping direction and possibly bringing either good or destruction. And we think about like how important words are. This quote, maybe my favorite quote from the last few years, maturity is realizing how many things don't require your comment. That, that is the kind of wisdom that comes from above. That other kind of wisdom, you know what that wisdom thinks? Cannot happen if I don't comment on it. Just going back to that public thing, I just thought about it. I, I do love this about Instagram, is that a lot of times when something good happens at Passion City Church, I'll see other pastors in Atlanta comment on the post. Pastor Jensen is great about that. Like something good will happen here. You go, wow, fire, amazing. And I think when other people see that, I would just think if I was another person going, wow, another pastor commented on a pastor's thing about something that wasn't that pastor's thing. Pastors have a lot of problems, by the way, if you didn't know. We got a lot of comp competitive nature in us and a lot of pride and a lot of, you know, it's all one big kingdom. As long as my church is bigger than yours, then it's all one big kingdom. And I want revival as long as it starts here and not at your church and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We all have a lot of issues. And when you see someone publicly do that, I think the outside world says, hmm, that's not normal. But then just to balance that with everything that flows by in your office doesn't require a comment from you. Be shocked. The world will go on and keep spinning without commentary from me. What's a practical thing look like? It looks like Proverbs 18, 20, and 21. This last one. It says there's the power of life and death are in the tongue. It's getting our heads around that. And it's, it's taking this, maybe the biggest step of all that you can take today to change this. So there is a real big difference in that. And so that that actually doesn't burn down your future, but actually creates an incredibly beautiful future because the proverb writer said the power of life and death are in the tongue so why not choose life today you say well louis i don't talk bad about people i, I don't tear people down i'm not someone they would I, I wouldn't be the person that they would all point to and go here gossip over here. there's your person right there oh, oh they, they, I, no i'm not that person i da, 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 da. i don't tear people down with my words but do you know the biggest issue for most of us is not that we're tearing other people's lives down with our words, it's that we actually are tearing our own lives down with our words. We're saying all the time, I, don't, I, don't, I can't see this working out. I'm not sure this is ever gonna be different. I don't know if I'm ever gonna be able to do that. I don't really see if this is gonna, how this is gonna come together. I'm really not really sure this is ever gonna change. And we are speaking over our own future and destiny all day long. We are the biggest spoke, spokesperson for our own future and we need to get under the mighty hand of God. And when you get under the mighty hand of God, you start agreeing with God, absorbing the heart, the mind, the, the thoughts of God, the, the, the mindset that is in the creator of the universe. And then you start speaking that. I don't know how this is gonna work out, but God is gonna come through. I'm not really sure how this is all gonna come together, but I'm walking with the king of the universe. I'm not really sure how you overcome something like this, but God is the God of the impossible. And I'm just gonna keep believing and I'm just gonna keep speaking that as long as I humble myself under the mighty hand of God, God is gonna accomplish His purpose and His plan in my life. I'm gonna speak life and not death, not just to you and you and you and you and you. I'm gonna speak life and not death into me and into my future in the direction that God has for my life. It might be tiny, but its power is titanic. And I'm going to set my direction 
toward the plans that God has for me. And I'm actually going to plant an orchard with this thing, not burn down a forest with it. 